Okay, thank and, you. And I see a battery. Uh, ah, no, the other guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I wasn't there before. Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me. And today I'm going to talk about the detectability lemma and quantum gamma amplification. And this is a joint work with Dorit Aronov, uh, Zef Landau, and, and Umesh Muzirani. Okay, so the general subject uh, in which this result uh, can be located is called uh, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. And this is a new uh, involving fields, uh, field that uh, has been involved in the uh, recent 10 years or so. And it can be seen as the, as the marriage of two seemingly very different fields. One is a complexity theory or constraint satisfaction problem, um, and the other is condensed matter physics. So in the first one, we have uh, notions like, uh, I mean, we, the general setting is we have n variables, and we, we have some constraints between them. And the main concepts are um, satisfying assignments, reduction, gap amplification, PCP, et cetera. Whereas in the condensed matter, instead of n variables, what we have is n quantum particles, and we have uh, some quantum constraint between them, which we call Hamiltonians, and uh, we'll talk about them later. And the main concepts here are qu satisfying quantum states, st states that minimize uh, some energy uh, that I will define later, and also the structure of entanglement of these uh, particular uh, states. Now, when we take these two things together, we get uh, the field of Hamiltonian complexity. And uh, in this field, the main, uh, I think the main uh, idea here is to analyze these, uh, these quantum objects using, um, using tools and notions from, from complexity theory. Um, and the, the main result in this, in this field, the, th the, the results that actually opened up this field was the, the quantum Kuklevin theorem that was proven by Kitaev in 98. And broadly, we can divide the result in that field into two categories. One is classical simulations of Hamiltonian system. We would like to know how hard it is to simulate these, uh, these physical system. And, and, we, and the other is, is, is uh, a bunch of results that can be important from, uh, imported from uh, complexity theory to analyze uh, other complexity issues of these, of these systems, such as um, reductions, and gadgets, completeness, and even maybe even PCP one day. Okay, so uh, this, is the, this is the field where we work in. And the main problem in this field uh, is, is called uh, the local Hamiltonian problem. Uh, and in order to uh, introduce it to you as gently as possible, let us, let us start with a very simple example of a classical problem, uh, the problem of Mach 3 sat, and see how we can write it in terms, in, 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 in a quantum language, okay? Um, so in the Mach 3 sat problem, we have uh, n bits, x1 to xn, and we have m local constraints between these bits. They can be taken to be three local, for example. And the goal here is to find the minimal possible uh, number of violations of this system. Now, we want to translate this the same problem, not, not modify it or change your, its, its complexity, but we just want now to write it in terms in, in the quantum language uh, of uh, Hamiltonian complexity. Um, so that the goal here now, so so is, so we will see now how we can transform this problem of of um, constraints into a problem of uh, matrices and eigenvalues. So how do we do it? The first thing is that here we work, instead of working with bits, we now work with qubits. So we're working with n qubits. So this, this defines um, a Hilbert space uh, uh, of, uh, of, two to of dimension 2 to the n. And, uh, and, this and the basis of this, and, and this uh, Hilbert space is spanned by uh, by basis vector of this form. Every basis vector corresponds to a classical assignment, okay? Now the central object uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this area is, is the Hamiltonian. And this is a matrix, a huge matrix that lives in this space. And this matrix is the, is the sum of M projections. For every constraint here, we define a projection and we require this projection to be a local projection. I will define what I mean by that. Uh, shortly. And the goal here is to approximate the lowest eigenvalue of this matrix of H. Okay? 
Specifically, we want to, and, and we call this lowest eigenvalue epsilon zero, and specifically we would like to, uh, to decide whether epsilon zero is zero or whether it is uh, bigger than or equal to one. And this will correspond exactly to whether we have zero violations here or one or more violation in the classical problem. So how, how do we do with it? So the idea is now to transform every, every such constraint into, uh, into a local projection Q. So let's, let's look at, at an example. So we start with, a, we pick some constraint, for example, xk or uh, xl0 or xm. So this, is, uh, this constraint is only violated when we have 0, 1, 0. Okay? So the idea now is to translate it into a, a projection on these three qubits now. And so uh, the projection must now live in an 8 by 8 space, which will project into the violating configurations. Okay, so the only violating configuration here is one zero one, is zero one is zero one zero. So we have a projection into this into this vector, and we have a tensor uh, a tensor product on the on the rest. I mean, we have identity on the rest, meaning that it does nothing to the other qubits. So um, let me just to make clear what this thing does. If we act with this projection on any basis state which has some Something here, and but we, which has zero one zero in the in the x l k m places, we get the same we get the same thing. Okay, because this vector lives, uh, this projection does nothing to this vector. But uh, whenever we have something which is different than zero one zero here, we have, for example, uh, zero one one, we will get we will get zero. Okay, so this is what this projection does. And as a result, it is now easy to see that uh, if we now sum all these uh, projections together and we, and we get H and we work with H on, uh, on a basis vector, then uh, the basis vector will be multiplied by the number of violations. Every time it violates a, a constraint, it will pick up uh, an identity here. Okay, so we see that the uh, the basis vector here are actually the eigenvectors, okay? And the eigenvalues are just the number of violations. It's not a unitary operation, it's worth saying in this context. No, no. I mean, it's it not even. No, no, it is uh, an emission matrix because it is a sum of, of projections, okay? So we see that the constraint satisfaction problem is satisfiable if and only if um, epsilon zero is zero, okay? So this, this was just an exercise uh, of translating a completely classical problem into the quantum setting. But now what is the, what is the general uh, quantum problem that hides in here? Um, the general quantum problem is called the local Hamiltonian problem. It is the quantum analog of, of CSP. And it is defined by, again, by, taking, uh, by defining a Hamiltonian, which is the sum of, of local projections, only that this time, these projections don't have to be don't have to be diagonal, like in the, in this simple example here. But they can be any uh, arbitrary projection as long as they are local. And uh, and the goal here is just like before to approximate the lowest eigenvalue of H to decide whether it is zero or whether it is bigger than some uh, one over poly. And it is important to notice that since the, these projections are no longer Diagonal, then also the eigenvalue, eigenvectors of H are no longer simple basis uh, vectors. They can be a very uh, complex superposition of, of many basis vectors. And this is what makes the problem so hard and so interesting. Okay? Now, it is worthwhile maybe to uh, also to have a different, uh, maybe a physical view on the local Hamiltonian problem. <coughs> How, are they, how is the input given? How are the uh, you just did a classical description of these matrices. Of the 8 by 8 matrix. Yes, for example. <coughs> so again, it make, makes the question so hard. It's hard even when they are in the standard basis, right? So uh, it's hard also in the classical, okay, yeah, also. But it is even harder here. OK, so. Um, we don't have an empty algorithm for the quantum analog. Uh, not even an empty even algorithm. An um, so, um, 
Okay, before I proceed, let's have a different, uh, a different take on the local Hamiltonian pr uh, problem and use some uh, language that is more uh, common in physics. So we, our goal is to approximate the lowest eigenvalue of H. This, this lowest eigenvalue can be written as this expression. This is a minimization over all possible vectors in the Hilbert space of this, of this expression. This is just H working on, on Psi and inner product with Psi. So obviously, if we minimize over all possible state in the system, we will get the lowest eigenvalue um, epsilon zero. Now, if we now look closer at this expression here, uh, by writing down the, the projection, we get this thing here. Um, this, this expression is called the energy of the state, okay? And it is just the sum of the, what we call the energies of each one of these constraints. So uh, this expression here, uh, which is always some, some number, positive number between zero and one, because remember that QI are projections, um, is called, it's called the energy of the constraint, okay? This is the penalty that we get for violating this constraint on one hand. And it is also, um, it is also the probability to detect a violation if we actually do a physical measurement on, on the constraint, okay? For people who don't uh, know this bar notation, it's just a quadratic form. Yeah, form yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I would say it's called Dirac notation and you just first, multiply Q, uh, operate with Q on the, on the state, and then you uh, take the inner product with, uh, with Psi itself. Okay, so, yes, exactly. So this is the local Hamiltonian uh, problem, and the natural question that arises is, okay, so what is the complexity of this problem? And uh, just like uh, 3 sat, for example, is NP-complete, it turns out that the local Hamiltonian problem is, uh, is also uh, quantum NP complete, and quantum NP is the class that is called QMA. And in an analogous way to NP, it is defined as all the decision problem that can be decided using now a quantum witness and, and a polynomial uh, <coughs> quantum verifier, okay? And the quantum Kuklevin theorem that was proven by Kitaev in, uh, in 98 said that uh, the local Hamiltonian problem is, is QMA complete, okay? So now the, the inclusion uh, part of this theorem is, is relatively easy because we have to convince uh, a guy with a quantum computer that this system has an, eigen, uh, has an eigenstate with zero energy. So the witness that we give him, we can give him a quantum witness, so we will just give him uh, the, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian itself, and he will be able to measure. Uh, the hardness, well, the, 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 the idea is similar to the proof of Kuklevin, but it is more involved and it requires some quantum tricks, okay? So, uh, so this is probably the main, the main result in, uh, in the field of quantum uh, in Hamiltonian complexity. Uh, you say how local they are? Like, uh, three, you have three local. Three local, uh, I mean, uh, it is, it is. Two local also complete? So yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So it's different than the classical, uh, in the, in the classical you have. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the uh, for the stuff, yeah, but uh, well, there is some complication. I mean, it it you should look at it more as um, uh, max instead of sat, uh, the, the true analog. Yeah, and max plus is also Yeah. Um, so what other what other classical results uh, have been imported uh, and techniques have been imported to uh, the field of Hamiltonian complexity? <laughs> so there has been a surge of results in the recent years, and uh, there was a, there are a lot of work done use, uh, of, of finding results using reduction and gadgets. These concepts and techniques taken from um, classical uh, complexity theory. Um, answering your question, it, it was proven that two local Hamiltonians, even on planar graphs, uh, are QMA complete. Uh, there has been uh, uh, works also on satisfaction thresholds, having very similar results to what we have classically, and even recently, not published yet, but uh, a Lovas local lemma done in the, done in the quantum setting. Uh, but it's not true that all the time uh, the classical results go through to the quantum world, and, and uh, one such example is, is local Hamiltonian in 1D, which is known to be uh, QMA complete. This is work by Aronov and et al. from 2007. But the uh, is one dimension. yeah, yeah. We just take 
Excuse me? Yeah, excuse me, what does it mean at 1 GL? Okay, it, uh, it's just uh, a Hamiltonian on a line. The definition of the every UI is just neighboring, uh, three neighboring uh, vertices? Yeah. 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 On, on a, yeah. It's, it's a it's in fact two, yeah. Excuse me? In fact, it's a uh, Hamiltonian on two nearest neighbors. Every local Hamiltonian chart uh -huh. is on two neighbors, not three. Uh, every Hamiltonian, yeah. But every, okay. um, so the quantum, uh, the quantum I mean, the, the complexity of the quantum problem here is QMA complete, but uh, when we look at the classical counterpart, max, max, uh, max stat on the, on the line, it is known to be in P. So things are not always the same. Um, so that kind of begs the question, uh, what about uh, PC, what about the PCP? It's uh, perhaps the most important result in, in classical complexity theory in the past 20 years. And do we have a quantum counterpart for, for this result? Um, so before we dwell in that question, let's first define what a, what a quantum PCP is. And, and just, just like in the classical case, I think there are two uh, convenient ways of, of defining it. Uh, one way would be that every language in QMA uh, can be verified uh, using, uh, only, uh, using a, witness, a, a quantum witness in a quantum computer that has only access to, say, Q random quint, uh, qubits um, from the witness. And another way, which is uh, equivalent under quantum reduction, would be that to decide whether uh, a local Hamiltonian problem has energy which is zero or energy that is bigger than some constant fraction of the number of constraints there is QMA hard. Okay, these are the two uh, possible ways and we will uh, concentrate on this, on this definition in this talk. Is it obvious the reduction needs to be quantum? Uh, no, it's not obvious, but uh, that's how that's what we know. Uh, we don't know a way. Uh, I mean, one way we know how to do it non-quantumly, but the other we we don't know how to do it. Uh, I don't remember now. By uh, and, and um, you don't need to have anything about like the analog of the random string. The analog of what? Of the random string. What is the random string? So well, the ran in PCP you have randomness. In the quantum uh, world, you you can use the quantum. Uh, no. Um, uh, you mean here in the in this uh, in yeah. this formulation here? Um, you define the size of the witness to be polynomial by saying Q may. Right? Yeah, that, that, yes, that's, that's to begin with. Yes, but um, well, you hit, it's kind of I mean it's it's kind of delicate because you, you the the verifier has to access only uh, ran, random Q. Uh, so, uh, and I guess what you're asking is how do I generate uh, the randomness to, d to, to probe these, these uh, Q? It is not clear that, well, I guess if he has a quantum computer, he can always toss it on, on, on the side. But it is, I mean, we, we didn't really look into that question uh, in these uh, fine details. So I, I can, it's not clear to me completely. Is this is this the same as saying that there is an algorithm that makes Q queries to the witness? Quantum algorithm that makes Q queries. But you have to restrict the length of the proof to be polynomial. Okay. Right, that's one way with the randomness to say if it's logarithmic randomness, the proof must be polynomial. So here, if you want to phrase it your way, you have to restrict the length but to be polynomial. Is the verify querying here in superposition, or is it like so? Is it like quantum queries where we, or is it like really only qubits? It's only qubits. Uh, that, uh, that's exactly the complication that, I mean, okay, we, we did not really settle. I mean, uh, we know that if, if, if he tosses some classical random coins on the side and <coughs> decided, okay, I have, I'm going to probe this, this, and these uh, qubits and work with them, then these two uh, definitions are equivalent under quantum reduction. If now you're suggesting something more elaborate of, you know, querying with superposition and this, I, I don't know, even know how to define it well. So. I have no answer for you there. No, it's, uh, this is surprising. I thought that uh, obviously the, the, the queries can be in superposition. You don't allow this. 
the queries to be in superposition? Uh, well, no. no. In, the, in, the, in the query, in the system that you'll get from the conjecture two, you'll classically choose the local constraint, yeah. and then you'll verify. That's right. Well, you may do it this way, or you can do it. You have a quantum algorithm. Yes, but you're not going to use the power of superposition. You're going to get a strong. Because if, if, in some sense, if in some sense you're allowed to query in superposition, then it means that you have the entire witness at your possession. Uh, or you, you somehow you're. Okay. So. I, uh, I guess it would make it, uh, but I'm not sure. I probably want to make it entirely random. Oh. Okay. I know, but well if, you, if it's not totally random. Uh, okay. So anyway, you don't allow it. It's just pure. Yeah, yeah. The, in, in this definition. Weaker conjecture, I mean, it's still the same. It's a weaker conjecture than one with superposition, but still, even, even that is open. Uh, it's open by, you know, by <laughs> since we didn't even look at it, so uh, yes. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is a difficult problem, and the reason why it is difficult to decide whether this theorem uh, is true or not true, whether this conjecture is true or not true, uh, is mainly because of the problem of no cloning that we have in, 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 in quantum. And what this means is that we cannot copy information, arbitrarily, arbitrary information in, in, in quantum mechanics. Um, and, and this copying of information seems to be a very crucial ingredient in the PCP proofs, okay? Because we propagate the witness and we copy its information all over the place. So what do we do quantumly? Um, so, so this seems like a very serious obstacle to proving uh, the quantum PCP, but we should not be very hasty because no cloning was previously thought to be <coughs> uh, to prevent the existence of quantum error corrections code, but we know that these, these codes exist. Okay, but, but it still seems that quantum PCP requires uh, even more than that. Uh, in particular, uh, it is hard to see how we can use these uh, quantum error corrections codes because they are not locally decodable. They are locally testable, but they are not locally decodable, so that makes kind of a problem to, to, to use them in um, in, in a proof. Um, but uh, whatever the resolution, uh, whatever the result turns out to be, whether there is a PCP pr uh, proof or not, uh, it's going to be extremely interesting. If we have uh, a proof for the quantum PCP, it will probably teach us a lot about the entanglement structure of, uh, say, local Hamiltonians and, and, and circuits in, in general. And um, it will probably also uh, give us some quantum in approximability, uh, in approximability result, and it will also allow for uh, quantum fault tolerance in certain models of quantum computation, like an adiabatic quantum computation. On the other hand, if we somehow manage to prove a no-go for the quantum PCP, still we will, uh, we will also probably gain a lot of understanding of the entanglement structure and perhaps some sort of a deep generaliza generalization of the non-cloning theorem. So either way, it's going to be very interesting if someone came up with this. So if you're saying um, that no go for the PCP is uh, if you find an algorithm for uh, approximating the... Or maybe, for example, if you, if, you, uh, if you prove that this problem is inside NP, then, uh, then you know, unless QMA equals to NP, uh, which is very unlikable, So that's one way. Is it implying any other? I mean, why is that unlikely? <laughs> hmm? why, why is it? Uh, unlikely that QMA equals NP. Um, and any other than. Um, Some people believe BQP. I mean, uh, I think that right now there, there is slight more belief that BQP is not inside NP than the other way, right? Well, we showed it, well, uh, for example, how it equalizes. But the. Like they are, they're supposed to randomness, right? I know, but you know. Yeah, but QMA is not a good thing. But anyway, 
So it's it's another interesting concept yeah. equals M. Okay, so if, uh, so if QMA equals NP, we have a quantum PCP, in other words. Okay, just use the classical one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We know already. So doesn't that sort of indicate um, that the congestion and not? I mean, given that the one D you know, general problem is QMA hard, but this gap version is. Yeah, but this is a spectral gap, and and here we are dealing with promise gap. I mean, we say that the lowest uh, the lowest eigenvalue is either zero or or CM, but what you are what you're talking about is, uh, is spectral gap. We, you, you know that the, you, you have some lowest eigenvalue, and then all other eigenvalues above it are, have, have this gap. So it's. Oh, I see. I, see. I mean, the, the Hamiltonian here does not have to be, does not have to have a spectral gap. It can be com completely degenerate. Wait, now I'm confused. So M is a total number of constraints. So therefore, the uh, maximum spectral gap would be M. Uh, Sorry. So uh, the, it, it's not a spectral gap here. It's it, it's the lowest. Uh, it's the lowest. Uh, <coughs> it's the lowest energy eigenvalue. Yeah. Oh, oh you mean the would be a little zero eigenvalue. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. S uh, say say again the question. I'm sorry. So you say either there's an eigenvalue which is zero or there's an eigenvalue which is t tensor. The smallest eigenvalue is t tensor. That's right. That's right. So, in, in some sense, in order to to to, to, uh, to in order to uh, to decide between these two questions, if I give you a, uh, such a system, all you will have to do is to find some uh, some eigen some eigenvalue between uh, zero or CM, and I will know that you know CM is not the is not the largest eigenvalue, is not the smallest eigenvalue. Oh, yes. oh I see. Whereas with the gap one, it's the same system has a gap. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's it's a promise gap. So it's two different systems. Um, okay, so, but what we do in this, in this talk is to, uh, is to focus on one central ingredient of the PCP proof, of specifically of, of the Nurse proof, that does not require cloning, and I'm talking about uh, gap amplification or in some weaker form of it that I will present shortly. Um, okay, so um, what it is that I want to amplify? In the classical case, what we want to amplify is the onset of a constraint of, of constraint satisfaction problem. This is just the minimal number of violations that we can achieve in the system divided by m, the total number of constraints. So it's in some sense, it, it is just a probability to pick up uh, uh, a violated constraint. Um, quantumly, the, the uh, quantum analog of the ansat is, is called the Q-ansat. And instead of having uh, the minimal number of violations, what we, what we use is the is the minimal energy of the system. Okay, Re recall that. Um, I will write it here. Um, epsilon zero was the minima over all the energies of this uh, in the uh, of the states in the system. So it can be it can be seen as the as the sum of over all the violations. So it's it's just the uh, the quantum analog to the total number of violations. Okay. So we would like to find a transformation that take a local Hamiltonian um, uh, with say q uh, on side equal to p and and scales it up to some constant times t times p. Okay. This is what we uh, would like to find. Um, so how do we do it? How do we do it uh, uh, classically? <laughs> how do we do that classically? Uh, so classically, um, there is a beautiful way to do it, and this is the, uh, the <coughs> basis of uh, the result of Pike et al. and Pagazio and Zuckerman for RP and BPP amplifications. And and the idea is that um, we can uh, we suppose that the system is defined on an expander graph. Um, then, if we now start taking uh, T it walks on. That the constraints are on pairs. Yeah. Too, too local. Yeah, yeah. Let's now restrict to this, uh, to this class. Um, 
then now suppose we, uh, the system is defined on an expander graph. Um, then, if, then if we now take uh, random t walks on the graph, uh, then the edges that we meet are, uh, are almost as if we are picking them randomly. Yes? So are these public schematic points of stuff with the correct Okay, I will uh, write me down and then I'll fix it later. Um, okay, so um, so if we now define a new system in which the, the constraints are defined by looking at T-walks on the, on the original system, and for each T-walk we now uh, define a new constraint, which is just the intersection of all the constraints on that T-walk, we get a new constraints, uh, a new CSP uh, system, and um, in which we know that the answer will be amplified by some uh, uh, linear, uh, it will be amplified linearly in T as long as it is, uh, we begin with something which is uh, small One enough. Has to prove it and we know for this, it's not. No, that's a simpler version. No, that's the, um, Oh, just the okay. That is, yeah, yeah, and also the neural proof, the much more involved version with which it has spheres and, and this is, okay, okay so. This increases the number of, this is like, it increases the number of without the reduction in output. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's just the, the visit in number to the unsatisfied list. Okay, so, uh, and the system size that we get here will uh, only scale moderately. It will only, it will be still linear in M, uh, the new system size. Um, so this is the big advantage of using expander uh, instead of just uh, T repetitions of the measurement. It's less local, of course. Excuse me? It's less local, the new constraints Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The new constraints are less local, so in a PCP proof, one has to now take care of that and make it local again. But uh, this is currently only what we are interested in. The PCP language, you think it will be like the randomized sequential repetition? Yeah. Okay. Even though we can run the area line subspace. Um, so, can this trick also work in the quantum world? Um, so in the quantum world, there is a, there is a problem. Um, the fact that uh, the fact that this uh, this uh, using expander worked in the classical world was that because we know that given uh, if we fix an assignment in for the for the classical system, it partitions this, this, uh, the, the edges the constraints into two disjoint sets: one of satisfied edges and one of unsatisfied edges. And we know that the the expander is enabled to probe these two sets faithfully. And, and therefore, we, we, we get an amplification. But quantumly, we don't have this clear-cut distinction between violation and, and, and satisfaction because every edge has its energy, right? It's uh, this energy here, which is some number between zero and one. Moreover, we don't even have uh, a distribution of assignments, okay, to work with. Um, and, and this is because, um, for example, to see that why, why we don't have this distribution of assignments, uh, let us, let us uh, for example, try to understand what is the probability of measuring a constraint A to, equal to be equal to one and constraint B to be equal to zero. Um, the probability for that is, it turns out to, to, to depend on the order of the measurement because if we first measure A to be equal to one and then it, uh, A uh, be equal to zero, then we have, uh, then this is the uh, probability for, the, for, the me for this measurement and unless A and B commute, this will be different than the probability of first measuring B equal to zero and, and A equal to one. So there isn't, uh, so this, this energy distribution does not even have some underlying uh, uh, distribution of assignments uh, that we ho can hope to work with. Is, is this point clear? Um, Uh huh. And then you do some me you measure. And then you what? And then you do a measurement to say what the the component of the eigenvalue is with respect to one of those two i's. Uh huh. Might it, it might it no longer be an eigenvalue? Uh, that's not 
correct, actually, because if, if it is if it is a, a com if it is a zero eigenvalue, if you, if you are in the, in the in the yes case and it is all zero, then if you make a measurement, then it is it will be already an eigenvector of every each one of the projection. Uh, so a measurement will not alter it. It will it will always remain. So completeness actually is is easy to prove here. Okay. Um, maybe I have another way maybe of of. Uh, of saying this is a crucial point, so maybe there is another way of uh, explaining it. Um, suppose we take a T walk on an expander in a quantum system, then the problem is that you know uh, once we measure this constraint here, the system changes; it collapses into a new state. Okay, so. Globally, we know that the, uh, the overall energy has to be bigger than the, than the, the ground energy. But do we know that, uh, that when we pick the, the next edge here on the, on the T-walk, it will, it, will it will on average be, be OK? In other words, how do we know that the system does not somehow fools us by collapsing adversely in such a way that whenever we make a measurement here, on the next step, we will, we will never detect a violation? Okay, so. In some sense, the, we know that the expander is random enough to break any classical correlations, but it is not clear a priori that it can also break and deal with these quantum correlations. So this is just another way of, of saying what I just said here. That, that issue, maybe to compare, like if you just repeat random, you know, pick a new random constraint every time, uh -huh. the non-de-randomized version. Uh -huh. So there you still have this issue of it. Every measurement changes the, s the state. Uh -huh. Since you know every, every state has bad, has bad energy, since you have independence, mm -hmm. then the conditional expectation is still high. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, that's right. So if you do uh, just uh, parallel, repeat if you just do this measurement repeatedly, you get amplification also in the quantum case. The quantum. Yeah, yeah, if you do t me random measurements. Amplified. The problem is that your system size will be huge. Okay. Um, so yes, so if A and B do not commute, we don't even have a distribution of assignments. And this is an important point, because it, oh, it is the key for the solution, actually. Um, so how do we proceed from here? Uh, so the idea now is to work with layers. And a layer uh, in, in a constraint system, we define it to be a set of constraints uh, that don't touch each other, okay? So for example, in this one-dimensional uh, system, a layer is just this uh, horizontal uh, line, this horizontal set of constraints. So these, uh, these constraints don't touch each other, okay? Uh, they don't intersect each other. So, they, this is the, so these are the layers. And for example, in this graph, uh, I color the different, uh, the different layers in different colors, okay? Um, so the first assumption that we take is that uh, we can partition the system into a, a constant number of layers, and this assumption is already given to us for free if we choose to work on a deregular expander. So it's not. Well, this is a constant. Yeah, so it's not. Uh, so it's not a problem. Um, now the advantage <coughs> of working uh, in, in a, in a, in with layers is that if we now fix our attention to one layer, then these constraints don't touch each other. It means that they, uh, these projections actually commute. Therefore, um, if you only focus on these guys and completely forget the rest of the, of the system, then a quantum state actually do, does, uh, does give us a, a distribution of, of uh, an underlying distribution of, of classical assignments to that layer. So if we now, so in other words, if we now only focus on one layer, the system becomes equivalent to an ensemble of classical of classical systems. Okay, so the idea is that may, maybe we can uh, use the classical uh, amplification result on each one of the members independently. Okay, so all we have to do is pick up uh, a layer in which this amplification will be strong enough, and this hopefully will push the entire system up. Um, and since there are only G layers, then, and we know that the total energy, total violation is greater than epsilon zero, then there must be one layer in which the energy uh, has some uh, constant function of, of epsilon fs, so epsilon zero, sorry. So uh, this, uh, uh, so we will pick this uh, layer. Uh, but then it's not that simple. 
Yes. So what you're saying is that if we work with the center of the world with this constant. If we work with what? With a constraint of the yes. degree which is constant, then mm. we basically don't have the, the problem that we discussed in the previous uh, slide. No, no, we still have a problem. No, no, we, we still, why not? We still have a problem. If it's a constant, first of all, it will be a constant. No, no, but maybe, this why, why will it be a constant? Maybe if you want no, to. No, no, well, because uh, let's suppose we start with the with the local Hamiltonian, we will stick with it. I mean, for example, we, if we want to quantize the news proof, then she always, her system is always no, defined. Sure, but maybe if you want to prove a quantum news proof, uh -huh. maybe what we should do is, is go to a degree to a constraint of with a huge degree and, and work with this. Um, you know, this, this is a possible interpretation of this. Like yeah. a possibility. Yeah, it is a possibility. I mean, can you do an analog of top energy on a top expanded trick to reduce the uh, sorry, I could not have. He doesn't. Well, first of all, uh, he doesn't need to. Kitai has, Kita has proved that. Oh, Kita has Kita has proved that uh, local Hamiltonian lo locality is three and maybe even two. If you may have, they might. No, 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 that doesn't do it. The, anal the correct thing you would have to prove is that you know the. If you want an expander, yeah. No, 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 no. Yes. Top elementary analogs result that if you have a gap problem, this is then without loss of generality, it's constant. Yeah, but he doesn't have a gap. He wants to generate a gap. He doesn't. I understand. Have a gap. But but this but but that's what that's what you uh, you can do. He's no, no, but he, you can just he's assuming that you've got the gap problem, right? Yeah. So yes. this is the problem that you're looking at. You're giving, you know, I'm giving a small a gap, and I want to amplify. Oh, you're giving it. you're giving an amplification theorem for quantum PCP. But we don't know that quantum PCP. Of an we don't know that quantum PCP is complete. That's right. That's what you want. Is that in the uh, limit? Uh, this won't. This won't. I mean, uh, I'm not. But, but just the, the, the uh, what Kitayev uh, showed, uh, it, uh, it also had this locality in, uh, in both senses. Not just the sense that uh, every constraint uses. Uh, uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't you're asking if, if it's a QMA complete problem, if I can define a, a QMA complete problem on a graph? For example, let's say... So uh, the answer is yes. Okay. No, but, but still, even if the answer is yes, still you need to prove it to a quantum mm. PCP theorem, if it's possible. And I guess the one-dimensional thing is uh, would be possible to do. For example. But if you want to prove something much smaller... But anyway, he still has his problem. Yeah, I'm still, uh, yeah, I'm still okay. struggling here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so there is a problem, and uh, so let's just remind we we want to pick a layer. in in that In that layer, uh, the quantum system is just an ensemble of classical systems, and we want to do the amplification there. So what is the problem? The problem is that what if in that layer, when we look at it, the distribution of assignments turn out to have this kind of shape? It is it is almost entirely made of completely satisfying assignments, and this is possible because we are now looking only at a subset of the system, which is very easy to satisfy. It's just a layer; the constraints don't touch each other, um, and it has nothing here in the middle. And the rest is just uh, a bunch of a bunch of assignments that are completely uh, falsified. Okay, um, it's still possible to to have this kind of. of Meaning that are, uh, all the constraints are are, uh, are false. Are, are, uh, all the constraints are falsified. Are, are violated. Uh, probably, probably they are also possible because some of them are violated and some of them. Yeah, are yeah, 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 yeah. But but uh, but, but what worries me is this kind of okay. what worries me is this kind of distribution. Okay, and um, in pl I. Uh, Um, okay, I don't understand that. Okay, but let me. Um, so why does this thing uh, worries me is because um, just first before before I con uh, continue, I mean, uh, from the energy point of view, this this configuration is is, is kosher, is legal because the the total energy here can be s still a fraction of epsilon zero. 
because we have uh, one over poly of the completely uh, uh, violated uh, part, which has energy of order of m. So altogether, we can have uh, a constant fraction of epsilon zero energy in this layer. So this this layer can can exist, um, or it can be simultaneous simultaneously in all layers. And the problem with this layer is that if we now try to act with the classical amplification on each one of the members of this ensemble individually, we will not get any amplification here. Why? Because we have two, we have only two types of ansatz here, and these are the two extreme cases where we, there is no amplification. One is ansatz is a zero ansatz, where of, because of completeness we don't have any amplification, and one is a completely saturated uh, part where, again, it is completely saturated. The ansatz here is one, there's nothing to amplify. So if we, if we have this kind of distribution and we plug it into the amplifi classical amplification machine, we will get no amplification. Okay, so if we want to somehow to prove that, uh, that there is quantum amplification, we must rule out the possibility that the system somehow conspires to behave like that in all layers simultaneously. Okay? It would have to be the case that it's not the same somehow uh, when it satisfies everything in one layer, it doesn't satisfy everything in the other layer. The same psi. What? The same. Yeah, yeah, for the same, for the same psi, yeah. 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 You don't mind if different uh, physics will have this property. They will have this property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind if one or two layers, add I just want one of them at least to, be, to behave properly. Um, maybe. It's, it's a possible direction, but... In fact, it's possible that any partition is good. The problem is proving it. Well, but sort of a pairwise independent partition should be, should be good. But then you I think that every partition is good. But then you wouldn't be disjoint or... I think if you put, yeah, I think, I mean, if you partition it into a constant number of layers, any partition will... Well, good. That, that, that for sure. I mean, I did not. Yeah, I did not uh, place any any restriction of how I partition it. Um, okay. So uh, so how do we rule it? And this is exactly where the detectability lemma uh, comes into play. And what the detectability lemma tells us is that this thing cannot happen simultaneously in all layers. And s specifically, how do we how do we define it? Well, we have the, we define these projections pi, uh, pi pi i for every one of the layers, and what these these projections do is to project into the accepting subspace of every layer. Okay, so in other words, every such pi projects into this part of the layer. Okay, um, and so we define these projections, and and there is an additional assumption um, that we use here, and uh, it is important uh, that the constraints that we use, these projections, are taken from a fixed set. Say we have only like 100 projections and we use them to build our system. So this is another assumption that we use. Why Prob is this an assumption? Um, you can't use a complete set of gates and then... You know yeah, it's not an assumption that hurts the, 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 the QMA completeness of the problem. It's just an assumption, it's just an assumption... Yeah, yeah. But actually I think we can get, uh, get rid of this assumption. But so the detectability lemma tells us that if the ground energy, if epsilon zero is greater than zero, then if we now apply pi g, uh, pi g and, then, and then pi g minus one, and then all the way until one, the norm of the state that we get will be uh, smaller than this expression here, which will be uh, strictly smaller than one, okay, by, by a constant. It means, okay, it, uh, what it means, and um, okay, um, what it means actually uh, that there must be at least. Uh, okay, let me just first give you some interpretation of it. So, um, first interpretation is that if we apply this uh, to any state, it will shrink it by 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 this constant. This is the straight thing that we have here. Um, and another thing, and, and a more uh, physical interpreta uh, interpretation of that, that it is that if we, if we look at these projections as measurement, measurement that are looking for violations, so if we look for violation in the first layer, and then in the second, and then in the third, and we do this me uh, these measurements sequentially, 
Um, the chances that we don't detect any violation are bounded away from one by a constant. So this is another interpretation of what. Uh, in constant is constant in epsilon zero. Epsilon zero, I take it as a constant. So constant, in, uh, I mean, there is no systems. Uh, the, it means you can think of it now. N doesn't exist. Uh, just a constant number of projections. Now it's an arbitrary bit, but as large as you want, and this constant does not does not depend on its dimension. It does not depend on m in particular, on the number of projections. Excuse me. Psi has more than one. Psi, yeah. Yeah, I begin with norm one. Yes. So the the corollary from this lemma is that if we uh, that if we sh again, I mean, uh, remember that these pi project onto the accepting onto this uh, to this uh, accepting uh, subspace onto the completely satisfied subspace. So um, if we do this sequentially and we get something which is smaller than one, there there must be some layer, okay, in which in which uh, this quantity is bounded away from one. So in other words, there must be some layer uh, in which we, we have more than one over poly in this region, okay? A constant fraction of thing in this region, and this what that shows that this conspiracy cannot happen. Um, before- why, why can it, why, why doesn't it mean that the, uh, I mean, uh, the thing that have full violations are shrink, are shrunk by the so. <coughs> the again, again. Ah, so the thing is that everything that has full violation, no, full violation is only. No, I don't. I don't understand the, uh, this corollary. Uh, well, the thing is that if you if you if all layers have one minus one over poly of satisfying uh, the way of satisfying, then if you if you if you measure them sequentially, uh, the the overall norm here will also be uh, 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 close to one, up to one over poly, but this is, uh, but this cannot be because we know that the no that this norm here is bounded away from one by constant. Well, it depends on epsilon zero. Yeah, it depends on epsilon zero, but, <coughs> but. They uh, could have like, as far as you're concerned, they could have one minus epsilon zero on uh, on satisfying. Yeah, yeah, epsilon zero. I take it as a constant. Yeah, I just don't want it to be one minus epsilon zero divided by m. Why? Epsilon zero. Uh, so, so here you say it would have been one minus one over poly and, and, and weight or no violation. Mm -hmm. So you can have, you can have, uh, I guess something like uh, one over m in. Uh, 1 over m in uh, 1 minus 1 over m in uh, epsilon 0 in no violation. And, and epsilon 0 in uh, completely, violate, completely violating. Epsilon 0 is not constant times m? No. Epsilon 0 is, is the complete energy. The ansat, the, the ansat is epsilon zero divided by m. Okay. So we are assuming that epsilon zero is a constant. Yes. And yeah. then you deduce from that that uh, in at least one layer you'll have a constant fraction. Exactly. You'll be, you'll be able to answer that. How yeah. far is it that the idea is constant? Like uh, that uh, the C it's, it's, it's important. I mean, uh, because C depends, C depends on G, yes. How it depends on it in such a way that if G becomes large, C becomes uh, small. But, but it's a uh, uh, polynomially, <laughs> I think, if I remember well. It's uh, not even sure, maybe e even exponentially. This can be like uh, interesting, but if we, the question is uh, whether we can take this big log log n and log n. Uh-huh. Um, well, I just don't remember uh, uh, precisely now what. Um, okay, so I see I don't have st too much time, so I will skip this. Uh, okay, so but we can uh, go along with Okay, so let me just give you a, a slightly different interpretation of the detectability lemma uh, <laughs> using a different system, a again, a local Hamiltonian system, but in this time, 
uh, it, we know it has a ground energy of zero. It can be completely satisfied. But we know that it has a spectral gap. So now it is a spectral gap. And we know that all other eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are bigger than this, this delta. Then what the detectability lemma tells us, um, that if we now expand an arbitrary state in terms of the ground state and all the uh, orthogonal states, and we act with these layers on this state, um, the orthogonal, uh, the orthogonal uh, part will get shrinked. Its norm will get shrinked by this constant, <coughs> by this constant factor. Therefore, if we now apply these layers, uh, say k times, we will get exponentially close to the uh, to the ground state. Okay. Now, proving this, uh, proving a, a polynomial convergence is very easy, but it is it is this exponential uh, convergence that is interesting and, and that what makes it uh, a little bit non-trivial. Okay, so uh, let me just outline the, the proof of the detectability lemma. Remember, we have, we, have the, uh, we have the state psi, and we work with it with these uh, projections. And, um, we, uh, and we want to prove that the norm of this state here, which we now define it to be omega, is smaller than this expression here. Um, so the first thing to note is that the energy, if we now take the energy of, uh, we now estimate the energy of, uh, of omega, then it must be uh, lower bounded by epsilon zero times the norm of omega. Okay, because omega is, uh, the norm is of course not necessarily one. What we will now show is that we can also upper bound this expression by, uh, by this ex expression here. And from these two inequalities, it is very easy to deduce this inequality. Okay, so our task now is to, is to, uh, derive this upper bound. Um, and it should be noticed that in the commuting case, uh, it is easy to see that this, the energy of omega is actually zero. Why? Because these pi, these projections, they project into the accepting subspaces, the no violation. And h is the sum of projections that project into the violating parts. So obviously, if we, uh, for example, all, all the energy of the constraints in pi 1, I mean, if we have now and h here, so all the energy of, of the constraint that participate in the first layer will be obviously will be zero because they were just uh, projected into their accepting subspaces. But uh, if but if the uh, these operators commute, these projections commute, then uh, this can be said for any other uh, layer because we can always shift it backward and and uh, and get zero. So. The idea of the proof is actually to show that the, the contribution due to the non-commuteness that we have in the general case don't, don't contribute too much, and that we still somehow can reduce it into the commuting case. So, um, so the first part will be to somehow quantify the non-commuteness in the system. And so this is actually the, 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 central, the center of the proof. And we do it by using a decomposition that we call the XY decomposition. And uh, the main object in this decomposition is what we call a pyramid. And a pyramid is just a, a collection of projections and that is defined as follows. We start with one projection, say, in, in the third layer here. And we now look at all the projections underneath it that intersect with it. And we add them to the pyramid. And then we look at all the projections below that and add it, et cetera, et cetera. We get this pyramid-like structure. Um, once we have the pyramid, we define the, the Hilbert space uh, of the corresponding qubits of the pyramid. We call it H pyramid. Okay, this, so this is just the Hilbert space of all the qubits here of, that support these uh, projections. This ordering is arbitrary. Okay. The ordering of the layer is arbitrary. Yeah, we, uh, but we picked one particular ordering. And now uh, the idea of the decomposition is to uh, decompose H peer into two uh, orthogonal subspaces, X and Y. X will be the commuting subspace, and Y will be the non-commuting subspace. Okay, and in the X, in the X, uh, the X subspace is 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 defined by the subspace that is spanned by all the common. Uh, why is this not working? Okay, all the common eigenvectors of all the projections in the pyramid, and the Y subspace will be just the rest of them. Okay, so it is uh, it is easy to see that um, um, these projections, com if we are restricting to the x uh, subspace, these projections commute, and it is also uh, 
well, it is not too hard to see that uh, the projection into these subspaces, x and y, actually commute uh, with, the, with the q's. Okay? Now, there is a very important parameter here in this decomposition that is called the, uh, the theta parameter. And we define it by looking at the norm of the product of all these projections here in the pyramid. Okay? And if we now look at the norm of this when it is restricted to the y subspace, then we know that this norm must be, s must be strictly smaller than 1. And the reason that, had it been equal to 1, there, have been, uh, there must have been, uh, would have been there a common eigenvector of eigenvalue 1 of all these projections, which is unlike the, uh, the definition. So, and now, if we now use the assumption that we have taken all the constraints from a fixed set, so there is only a constant number of combinations that of, pro of projections that can occur in, in, in a pyramid, because the size of a pyramid is also constant. And therefore, we know that for all pyramids, this, this norm will be, bound, will be upper bounded by some constant theta, which is bounded away from 1. Okay? So this is this parameter theta that I'm... Okay? Okay, so now that we have pyramids, uh, there must be some Ponzi hiding around somewhere. So, um, so what is a Ponzi? A Ponzi is just a collection of, of constraints in a, given in a given layer such that the, the pyramids underneath them do not intersect. So a Ponzi in this, in, in the, in this picture would be just the, the set of uh, just the Q1, Q2, and Q3, okay, just the tops of the pyramids. And the idea now that, uh, first of all, uh, it is not hard to see that we can partition any layer to a constant number of Ponzi's, and therefore we can partition the entire system into a constant number of Ponzi's. Yeah, I mean, we can, uh, you know, this is one Ponzi, and I can find another Ponzi, is this guy, this guy, and that guy, and the three, and then but three. They, they have intersections. No, they, they, the pyramids of the different Ponzi's may intersect each other, uh -huh. but the requirement is that the, the, if I fix the Ponzi, then the, these pyramids there do not intersect themselves. Okay? Um, so now, once we have a Ponzi, we can define, uh, it induces a complete x-y decomposition for the entire Hilbert space. And it has sectors that are labeled by x, y, uh, et cetera, okay? So we can label each sector by uh, a string ni of x's and y's. This means that we have, for example, x here, x here, y here, et cetera. And we can define our projection into these sectors, which we call p ni. And, uh, and generally, we can uh, expand any state, in particular omega, in terms of this decomposition. Okay, we just expand it into uh, the different states. Um, so this is the, the x-y decomposition. And just uh, let me now remind you what we were after. Um, we wanted to upper bound this quantity. Okay, we wanted to show, to show that it is smaller than this. So what is the advantage of using this, this kind of decomposition? Um, well, first, we, can, we see that since there are only uh, a constant number of Ponzi's, then we can, uh, then if we, if, we, if we now prove this for every Ponzi, it will be sufficient, okay? The, en the total energy can be now written as the total energy at each Ponzi, and we, if we now uh, prove this uh, result instead of H, we will write H Pons, we will have some other constant, and since we have an, a, a constant number of Ponzi's, we will be able to deduce it for the, uh, for the entire Hamiltonian. Um, and moreover, because the pon uh, because H Pons, the, the, uh, the, which is the sum of these, cons of these constraints, which are inside the pyramids, so they commute with the, with the projection into the, into the sectors, then uh, the energy of this, of, this, uh, of this Hamiltonian can be written as the contribution from each one of these sectors. So there are no cross terms, okay? So this tells us that we can analyze each one of these sectors uh, by one by one. So this is... Why is this constant less than one? Is the constant theta? No, I'm not saying it is less than one. Well, if it's not less than one, then the upper bound is not very useful. Why not? Because I thought that you want to get eventually a bound yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah, but I mean, that's 
Yeah, but you, you want to get something like that. One of these quantities reduces, uh, makes this uh, a little bit less than uh, than uh, omega squared, right, or something. Again, so you, you want to, you want to show that you lose a little bit in the norm in one of these quantities. Yeah, but, but uh, what, what what I mean is that I mean what I want to prove is is this epsilon zero smaller than some constant time one minus. Okay, and I don't care what this constant there, because it will. I mean, you will just end up. I mean, if you now solve this inequality, you will just get get something like that. This is always smaller than one. Um, okay, so um, so how do we how do we estimate the, uh, this energy? Um, so the idea is now that uh, uh, if we now f focus on a, a sector, uh, then the non-commuting parts do not contribute too much to the energy of this uh, of this sector, of, of the of the, of the of the Ponzi. And uh, to see that, uh, this is exactly what the exponential decay lemma says: is that for every sector. Uh, let us define uh, the amplitude of, of Ni to be the number of y's there, then the, um, then the amplitude of omega Ni must it decays exponentially in the number, in the number, of, uh, in the number of, of y's there in the, in the sector. And this would tell us that uh, we cannot have, uh, that sectors with many y's have very little uh, contribution to, to omega. Okay? And this is good for us because many y's mean that it is, in some sense, very non-commuting. So in, in some sense, it tells us that the mo most of the contribution to omega will be from the commuting parts. And we know that the commuting case is easy. Okay? And the way to prove it is just to write pi j. Pi j, rem I remind you, is just the uh, projection to the accepting space. We can write it uh, uh, every pi j as a as a product of the of the of the one minus of one mi of the complement of the projections in that layer. So, if we now have a, a product of pi pi one times pi two pi pi three, we have this huge product of of uh, of operators, and from this product product it is uh, it is well it is possible to extract this pyramid here. And whenever we have a y sector, we know that the product of all the of all the operators in the y sector must be must get uh, a, a theta factor. So therefore, we get an overall factor of theta for every for every y sector. Therefore, we have this exponential decay. Um, and now, if and now once we have that, um, it is it is easy to see that only it is only the y sectors that actually contribute to the energy of the Ponzi's, but since they are uh, but since their weight is very small, we can have some sort of uh, upper bound for the energy of every Ponzi. And from here, it is possible to have the, this bound over there. It's some more technicalities, I will, not, I will not go to it. But this is, this is the, main, the main idea of the proof, okay? this exponential decay behavior. Okay, so this concludes the detectability lemma. It does not conclude the, uh, the gap amplification. Uh, to prove the quantum gap amplification, one must use uh, this detectability lemma and even uh, a, a more general version of it that deals not only with either it is the, the layer is completely satisfied or violated, but whether there are some L violations there or not. So uh, a more general version of the detectability lemma is needed. And that, together with the classical amplification results, tells us that there always must be a layer in which uh, the classical amplification will be uh, significant, and therefore the overall amplification of the system uh, will be uh, will be will be non-negligible. Um, so this is just the the formal uh, uh, definition of the of the quantum gap amplification uh, lemma and. Essentially, we say, okay, we have a quantum system, a local Hamiltonian that is defined on an expander, uh, regular with some uh, largest I normalized lar largest eigenvalue uh, lambda, and now we build a new 
uh, local Hamiltonian system by looking at all the T-walks, and for every such T-walk, we look at all the accepting subspaces along the walk, and we take and we look at we take their intersection, and by this we define the new projection. We, uh, for so we have now a new system. We call it GT, and the ansat of GT will be amplified with respect to the original ansat uh, by uh, a constant factor T until we reach uh, saturation. So this is uh, just like the classic classification. It's interesting to notice that this does not hold, uh, this does not hold per, per state, whereas the classical assignment, uh, the, the classical amplification does hold for every assignment. For every assignment we have an amplification. Here it is just for the ground state that we can prove it. I mean, it, is, it might not be true for every, uh, for every assignment. Um, well, it's just a factor that comes from the C, uh, from the detectability lemma. Uh, what is it? No, 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 just what are these parameters? Oh, w is, w is the size, W is the dimension of the particles that sit here. So it's, it can see it's, it's a bunch of three qubits, for example, then W will be eight or something like that. And D is the, is the regularity of the graph. Okay. Um, so... Well, do we have a, I mean, how, what is needed now to, to prove uh, the quantum PCP? Um, as you probably guessed, a lot, a lot is needed. Um, currently, we do not know how to do anything that, uh, that requires cloning. The no cloning obstacle seems very serious. Uh, so we, in particular, we don't know how to do degree reduction, uh, where, you know, this, the size of the configuration system increases. We don't know how to do amplification with spheres. Here, the amplification did not alter the, the, the size of the configuration space, so that's why we were able to do it. And um, we also don't know how to do uh, alphabet reduction. But I suspect that, well, if there is a quantum PCP, I don't know if this is true, but if someone would find a solution to any one of these problems, probably this one seems like the, the easiest one, then it will be the trick how to do everything here. So. Uh, this no cloning thing, this, this way to enlarge the system uh, and still uh, maintain locality is the, is the, is the main problem here. Um, so let me just conclude by saying that uh, the detectability lemma has some merits on its own. Um, in particular, we can prove an analog of the impagazo zuckman RP uh, amplification, also a quantum version of that. We still don't know whether it is possible for BPP. Um, it allows for a, a great simplification of the proof of the one-dimensional area law due to Hasting, which uh, tells you that if you have a local Hamiltonian system uh, on a line, a one-dimensional local Hamiltonian system, uh, then the grounds, uh, then if you look now at the ground state and you chop it into two, the entropy of, uh, of, of each part is, is, is at most a constant. So this, is a, this was a very important result, but um, an hour if you use now the stability lemma, you can uh, you can greatly simplify it. Wait, and this is this is part of the same paper, or is this a new result? My uh, our paper? The simplification. No. I've never heard of this. Oh huh? uh, no, it's an it's a new result. We it, we didn't really publish it yet. Like very new. Yeah. Because maybe you should know it like two weeks ago when I published it. Uh, you should have known, but uh <laughs> 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 yeah, it's very new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's still open whether uh, we can use the uh, the detectability lemma to generalize it into higher dimensions, um, and you know perhaps there are some other uh, interesting uh, applica uh, applications of uh, of it. And it particularly seems suitable in places where the commuting case is easy. So, and the area law is one of these examples. Proving the area law is extremely simple in a commuting system. Um, so there are some uh, more open questions uh, hanging on there. So first of all, uh, it will be interesting to resolve the complexity of the commuting Hamiltonian case. Um, see whether we can uh, come up with a PCP uh, for if under the assumption that the, that the Hamiltonians are completely commuting, the projections are com completely commuting. And but it's still even not, uh, even not known what is the general complexity of the local Hamiltonian problem if the, if the Hamiltonians are, are, are uh, commuting. We know that if it is on a graph, for example, it is inside NP. 
Um, and then there is the question of uh, quantum PCP. Uh, for example, the definition, we're still not sure what the right definition is, it's answering your questions. Um, can we prove it even with an exponential witness? That will also be a great, uh, a great uh, advance. Um, so, and in particular, also, if, okay, suppose there is no quantum PCP, then what is the complexity of, of approximating uh, this quantity up to a constant? Is it NP? Is it, is it uh, harder than that? And um, for the de detectability lemma, um, can we, it's interesting to see whether we can drop this requirement for a fixed set of projections. Uh, this, I think, is probably doable, not too hard. And are there any further generalizations using general Hermitian matrices instead of uh, projections, etc.? So uh, this is it.